We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 117. Today we're going to talk about... Daca fabric, bohemian grave goods, and an Australian bone tool. Let's dig a little deeper. So, as you can see, we are not in the United States. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that from this picture. Wow. There's palm trees in the United States. That's true, there's palm trees in Florida. So, <laughs> we're not in Florida. We are in Cancun. We're on vacation. We had a vacation that was canceled because of the pandemic last year. And we got the opportunity to use it. And it was like things were expiring. We just sort of kind of had to go for it. It was a last yeah. minute thing. So here we are recording a podcast That's in right. Cancun. <laughs> yeah. I'm keeping my sunglasses on. I don't care how unprofessional it is on camera because <laughs> the sun is going in and out and in. And it's just too much. Probably should have sunscreen on. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's definitely going to be a little crispy critter by the end of this. But, but hey. Be sure to tune into next week's episode because we are spending all day at Chichen Itza tomorrow. Yes. And we should have some good stuff to talk about. Yeah. Uh, as a result of And that. good pictures. Yeah. We'll be in video too. We'll, we'll do a lot of stuff so that we can yeah. share our experience at a really cool ancient city with all of you guys. Yeah. Yeah, because we, as archaeologists, have learned about Chichen Itza as one of the foundational things that you talk about in Archaeology 101. Mm -hmm. And you just hear about it all the time. Yeah. So it'd be fun to finally go there and see it and see what's going on. Although we've heard that you can't climb up the pyramids anymore, which I guess is actually a good thing for the it's pyramids. A safety thing, too. Well, yeah, it's a preservation thing, too. Yeah, but also, yeah. some stupid tourist tumbled down one of them a year, number of years back, and probably more than a few tourists have. And probably. they just finally said, okay, no more climbing. Yeah. Yeah. But that's good from a preservation yeah. aspect, too. For yeah. Sure. All right. So what's the first article? Okay. So the first article, it's very, like, archaeology adjacent, I would say, because it's called The Legendary Fabric That No One Knows How to Make. So, of course, you've got your typical, like, title trying to draw people in yeah. to reading it. But it is really true. And I did. I got totally drawn into the article. I read every single word of it. And then I went down a rabbit hole trying to research more about <laughs> the fabric, too. Not a whole lot more that I could find other than what this article talks about. The BBC did a really, really great job of like describing what it is and who made it and everything. I was really impressed with the article itself. Yeah. So it's called Dhaka Muslin. That's the fabric that they're talking about. It was made in Bangladesh, which was formerly Bengal, for thousands of years. They had really perfected the art of making this very specific type of muslin. And then it just totally disappeared by the beginning of the 20th century. Wait, how, how's that kind of fabric made? Like, what is it? Well, it's cotton fabric. Okay. And muslin is, in today's term, like, because I'm a sewer, in today's terms, you'll find it at the fabric store. It's usually just like a basic plain weave cotton fabric, varying qualities, varying thickness, varying types. But back in the day, like historical times, muslin was used to make basically articles of clothing that were called muslins. And it was just like your underlayer, you know? Like it was a shirt. I think for men, it would have been like this long shirt thing that you would wear underneath whatever the men's fashion of the day was. And same for women, but it would be more dress-like. Yeah. And I think it was like a... And a lot of my information comes from romance novels, so like... <laughs> No, I'm just saying. Come on. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no. It was like a nightgown type of thing that women would sleep into. And I think men as well. So it was just like your basic undergarment. Very lightweight. Almost always cotton. Or I think it could be linen too. And the idea was to like create a layer between your body and the clothing that you were wearing on a day-to-day -day basis. Because the clothing was heavy and complicated. And you didn't have that many of the dresses and the garments or whatever. So you you would put that put this muslin in between your body and the clothing and then the clothing could be worn multiple times without going through a full washing it could just get spot cleaned 
because it wasn't touching your body, so it wasn't picking up body odors and stuff like that. Okay. And where was this again that this we're particularly talking about? This particular fabric was made in Bangladesh, formerly Bengal. But this style of dressing yourself goes back hundreds of years in all of Europe, basically. And, you know, the United States once it, it became a thing. It was just a way to separate your clothing from your body so that you could wear it multiple times without right. having to do a full washing every single time. Yeah. And this muslin fabric was used to make those underlayers. And so the thinner it was, the better it was. Because it could still provide that layer of protection, but it wouldn't be too hot or too bulky. This fabric is really interesting, though, because it's made of cotton that was local to the area, to Bengal. And it was a shorter staple length. And what staple length means is how long the strands are when you go to spin them into yarn, which you would then weave with, right? And the stuff that comes out of, like, South America, for example, which is where I think, like, 90% of the cotton today comes from, is a much longer staple length. And it was much easier to spin the South American cotton into nice yarn that was soft and good for weaving into right. these fabrics. But this cotton is a much shorter staple length, and they call it lumpier. And I don't really know how lumpier would mean that it was better, but somehow it was because it was very soft. But what lumpier did mean is that when the Industrial Revolution came along, they couldn't put it through a machine. And machines took over almost all fabric processing, you know, in the 1800s, but this particular cotton could not be put through a machine because of the consistency of it. So it had to continue to be spun by hand. And they did continue doing it for a long time until by the early 20th century. It just stopped. And there's a there's some specific reasons. But before we go into that, what I'm talking about by very fine here is the thread count. So you know you've heard thread count as far as like sheets go and stuff like that, right? Like the higher the thread count, the better, right? So today's fine cottons are somewhere in the 40 to 80 thread count range. Yeah. Now this stuff, 800 to 1200. Jeez. I know. That's like so, the fancy stuff you get at pottery barn. <laughs> Pottery barn is that as fancy as you can go? <laughs> is that like the epitome it's, of fancy to you? As <laughs> fancy as I know. <laughs> I don't even remember the last time I was in a pottery barn. I know, right? <laughs> like West Elm is like a step above pottery. Oh, pottery yeah, West Elm. Yeah, 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 there you go. Yeah. Okay. It's nice. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. That's that's the quality level that we're talking about here. And it was made by the people of the Mughal Empire that was founded in 1526. And though they had been making this fabric before that time, the Mughals really, really just streamlined the whole process and they realized the value in it and they helped support more artisans. Like the royal family was supporting the people that were making this clothing and they really made it part of like the, the economy of their empire. Yeah. And it, they were using it for trade. It was making it all over Europe. So by 1526 and beyond, it really becomes popular in Europe and elsewhere. Yeah. And in particular, in the 1700s, Marie, Marie Antoinette and Josephine Bonaparte, they were wearing it all the time. And of course, people wanted to copy them. And this is also the same time period where gowns that had been these huge voluminous things, they were becoming smaller and slimmer by the early 1800s. This like high-waisted sort of empire look. If you watched that show that just Bridgerton's that just came out on Netflix, it's that style of gown that's very like lightweight and like Josephine Bonaparte would like make a gown out of this really thin fine fabric and like nothing else. And there's all kinds of like jokes and stuff in the newspapers of the time, like you making fun of not just her, but all the like ladies that were wearing these gowns that you could basically see straight through. <laughs> but it was okay because it was like the style and it was it was fabric. So yeah. Anyway, it's very popular because it was so light, so sheer, and so fine and soft. Interesting with the cultural transmission of stuff like this because back in the day. Well, now, if somebody like that wore something, 20 million people would see it five seconds after they posted it on Instagram. <laughs> right. And then they'd be immediately going to Amazon or wherever and buying yeah. the same thing. Yeah. But back then, it's not like, when you say everybody wanted to copy them, it's not like they're just out about town and seeing these things. It's right. probably the the inner circle and the and the, the, the people who go to court, you know, could, could, could see, see what they this, were doing. Could see the fashion. 
yeah. and would copy them yeah. and then bring that back to their estates yeah. or you know their hometowns or wherever they go. Yeah, instead of spreading yeah. in a matter of days, it spread over, over decades. a season or years. Yeah, I would I would even say decades because yeah. it took a long time for the fashion to shift from these big voluminous dresses to the more slim slim lined look that became popular in like, right. the Regency era, like early to mid eighteen hundreds. And then this fab- fabric in particular was really great for the dresses, but it was very see-through. So, like, it just took a while for them to figure out both how to make it in a way that was modest for young ladies to wear, or not, if they didn't want to. Maybe the courtesans were wearing stuff like this that then didn't worry about modesty. I don't know, but, but yeah, it was definitely, like, the epitome of, like, this level of fabric though like yeah. this stuff was what everybody wanted okay now here's my favorite quote from this article as you guys can probably tell like i fell in love with this article and i basically forced chris to talk about it with me because i love fabric and stuff so yeah he's that's true <laughs> real interested in the history of the dog fabrics anyway so this is my favorite quote from the article it was all going so well then the british turned up <laughs> So, as you might imagine, the British conquering, or not conquering, the East India Company, they conquered the Mughal Empire in 1793. So, I guess it is a conquering. That word is iffy, but we'll go with it. And they they took over the industry, and they saw how popular the fabric was with European ladies, and they just put a lot of pressure, like top-down pressure, on the artisans to make more of it, to make it faster, and not necessarily better. So quality issues came into play. And, um, but they recognized how important it, it, of a money-making tool it could be for them. And because of the pressure they're putting on the artisans, the quality suffered. And because the quality suffered, people weren't willing to pay the prices. And in a lot of cases, what was happening was they were prepaying for the fabric. Like they knew they wanted X amount of this really fine fabric. So they would prepay for it so that they could pay for the supplies and things to make it. But then the fabric that would get to whoever bought it and they'd be like, uh, no, this is not the quality that I paid for. Um, refund me now. Yeah. And enough that happened enough times that it just collapsed the entire like artisan system of creating this fabric. And that I mean that was that. Like in the the it was like a vicious cycle, basically. This vicious cycle where, like, they kept prepaying for fabric, but the quality kept going down, and then they would refuse to pay for the prepaid fabric. And I'm kind of like, well, I'm sure the quality was still, like, really good, even if it wasn't top quality. So, like, what happened to all the, like, <laughs> the, like, seconds, if you yeah. will? But I didn't see any information about what exactly happened with that. But, yeah. And, like, and, and that was that. Like, it just, the, the fabric production almost ceased completely. Now this cotton, it's called the Puti Carpus plant, is the one that produced this very specific cotton that they used. And it was always like half tamed. It was not easy to cultivate. It was always on the edge of not being a tamed, cultivatable, if that's a word, plant. Yeah. And they just they just lost it. Like when they stopped making the fabric and they stopped producing the cotton, the the plant just like receded back into the wilds and it was lost. There were no seeds. There was no way of bringing it back once it was gone. So the interesting conclusion of this article by the BBC is that there is a researcher who wanted to try to bring it back. And he went to the area. Well, first he found a packet of like pressed leaves that they could code the DNA sequence from. So he got the DNA sequence of the of the plant so they knew what that looked like. And then he went out and combed the the riverside basically because it's one particular river that it grows along. Combed the riverside, found some plants that were similar enough. He found one that was like 70% the same DNA wise and used that to create the plant that was as close as possible to the original Puti Carpus plant. Mm-hmm. And then after doing that, getting that to grow, that took a lot of time. He went to the the local fabric makers in the area, because they do still make fabric here, and he had to convince them to try to make the fabric in the old way, which meant hand spinning 
and then hand weaving and doing everything by hand in order to get this 800 to 1200 thread count stuff. Yeah. And like basically nobody was interested. <laughs> they're like, right. what? Stop production to do this weird research project? No, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> they're all very happy to learn about the history according to the article. So that's cool. They're interested in their history, but not interested in trying it. <laughs> Which I get, you know, you gotta pay your bills, right? But he talked one one owner of a I guess a fabric mill, you could call it, into trying it. And the best they could get was three hundred thread count. And it took a long time to produce that. But hey, they're working their way back towards it and maybe we'll have some really high quality muslin that probably is way more expensive than anybody any normal person is willing to pay. But they're still trying to bring it back, which is cool. There you go. Yeah. All so right. That's that. I just talked a million miles <laughs> like fifteen minutes. Yeah, this is kind of more your thing. <laughs> Welcome to the historical yarns preview. Uh, for the historical oh, yarns podcast. Yeah. It's a great yeah. article. Yeah. I definitely recommend reading it if you have any interest in the history well, of fabric and fashion or anything like that. Mm-hmm. This kind of does come down to a subject that is very relatable to archaeology and that's experimental archaeology. Yeah. A lot of times in order to understand how things were done, I would even say it a lot of times, in every time, in order to understand really how things were done in the past and how to do it is, is to try to replicate it. Mm-hmm. And if you can try to replicate it with the means of the time period with which you can date it to, then you can have an idea of how people actually did things. Mm-hmm. A common example is like arrowhead projectile points. Oh, yeah. You know, sure. flint napping. People, yeah. people are always trying to replicate these these old tools, and mm-hmm. we think we know pretty well how to do it. There's a number of ways you can you can do these techniques, and, you know, any one group may have used a different technique over another, but there really, there really is only a handful of ways to do it. Mm-hmm. So replicating those and figuring out what it looks like, and then, you know, other types of weaponry. Weaponry is easy to replicate. Yeah, well, not easy, but it's a common one to replicate. Yeah, I think yeah, like but then like, people yeah, yeah. But like fabric making techniques and food making and mm-hmm. things like that. That stuff you just need to kind of do it to see. Well, yeah. these are all the ways it could be done. So, what tools did they have at their disposal yeah. at that time period? What kind of techniques have been invented, and uh, what's the most likely method they used to do it? I think that's what has always drawn me to knitting and handcrafts of that sort is because it is this sort of connection to the way things were done in the past, and it's just really great to like hold yarn in your hands and knit something with it, which is my preferred method yeah. of creating. But but also to spin and weave and sew and do all those things by hand the way that it was done just connects you to the people that you're also studying when you're a historian or an archaeologist or whatever. So I like that connection. All right. Well, that sounds like a good break point. We're going to take a break and come back in a minute. If you're watching this on YouTube, then it's really just a really short break with a little message from the APM, and then we're back into it. If you're not watching this on YouTube and you're listening to the podcast and you want to see us sitting here in Cancun on a, on a way too bright area and watch <laughs> me sweat more and more as the show goes on, then head over to youtube.com forward slash arcpodnet. And uh, actually, I don't think that's it. Look at the link in the show notes, and we'll, we'll have a link to the YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be our pod if we get 100 subscribers. So then yeah. we can change the URL. Yeah. So subscribe. Oh, yeah. Go subscribe so that we can do that. Please. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, all right. We'll be back in a minute with segment two. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z E N C A S T R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code T-A-S. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing, and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. 
All right, welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 117. And if you're listening to the podcast, head over to YouTube or check out the show notes. Look up Archaeology Channel. Not the Archaeology Channel. I mean, it could be, but there (laughs) there already is an Archaeology Channel. The Archaeology Podcast Network. Also, check out the Archaeology Channel. They're a fine outfit with many great things. Indeed. Um, Also, this is our first live podcast. Oh, sorry, not live. Our first video podcast. For this show. For this show. So you'll have to, like, forgive us. We're still figuring out how to, like, record audio podcasts, but also have video. With it. Also, I forgot Different. the key cords for my microphones, so that's sitting inside the, the hotel here, which is why the audio probably isn't great on the yeah. podcast. Yeah. Yeah, that's where we're at right now. Hey, so. it is what it is. We're in Mexico, and we're determined to bring an episode, so it's happening. S- speaking of precious objects, oh, like microphone nice cords, transition. precious <laughs> objects <laughs> found in a... Uh, Gold and precious gems unearthed in a 5th century grave in Bohemia. They have all the best stuff in Bohemia. I know. And including Rhapsodies. They're amazing. <laughs> but... And macrame. And I wouldn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, this is uh, an example of a 1,600-year-old grave that was not looted. Graves are always looted. It's so funny how... This is as, as an aside. We always say how, oh, in the past they had much more respect for blah, blah, blah. No, nope, all graves were looted. <laughs> well, in this one, yeah, I know. In this <laughs> one specifically, the looting appears to have happened not long after they were buried. Well, too. of course not. So That's when all looting like, happens. People, local people knew that some rich people were buried, so they're like, payday. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so. But in this case, there were six graves total. Five of them were heavily looted, but they missed the sixth one, and that's how we get all this yeah. precious things that they found there. Yeah, and you know, this doesn't give me a very good picture into normal everyday life, which is most people by finding these precious objects, because most people are going to be buried with this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But it it'll, it is still kind of a, a good example of technology, and and by technology, I mean like manufacturing technology. You know, they're making techniques for what they do, mm-hmm. which would also include with these metals and and some of the stones and things, the gems, you know, their knowledge of local resources mm-hmm. and and things like that where they can extract those and process those and use them in a way that makes some of these uh, really fantastic objects. So well, in that sense, you can learn about this a lot about the society by studying these high class sort of items. Yeah. And not only that, but also what they're training for, too. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. I... I don't know if it happened with this in particular, but you know, when you see something that came from somewhere very far away and is not related to the people that it was buried with or found with, right. then you know that there's some really intense training going on to get that there. So, yeah. yeah, and we said Bohemia, but that is what's known now as the Czech Republic yes. to sort of place this in space for you. Yes. And I guess what was found was a, a, a number of precious objects, and some of the ones highlighted in this Life Science article was a headdress and four silver buckles that were inlaid with gold and studded with semi-precious stones. Yes. They were probably very precious stones back in the day. Yeah. But now they're only semi-precious. <laughs> oh my God. So, I guess. Well, I mean, there's a difference, right? Well, there is. We're calling them semi-precious stones, but... Isn't that, know. like, just assigned by humans, though? Like, it's what people assign more value to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. what I'm saying. They and were probably they... very precious back then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. They're very sought after. Yeah. So, and, like, a bone uh, comb, which I thought was really cool, ceramic mm-hmm. pot, an iron knife. Yeah. Um, all kinds of stuff. Does, does it say uh, this was a woman, I think? Yeah, this is the the woman's grave. Yeah. There was a mix of men and women in the whole, like, grave between the six individuals. Yeah, did the, something happen? They are all buried at the same time? I don't know. It didn't say what the circumstances are. No, it did talk a little bit about the skeletons and what was wrong with them that could have potentially contributed to why they died. Yeah. Um, one of them definitely had can- uh, cancer, probably. I said definitely, but probably had cancer, like the bones exhibit what cancer would look like. Right. One of them had uneven development of one of the legs, mm-hmm. which they think might mean that person had a stroke because like as if one side of their body wasn't being used as much as the other side. Mm-hmm. And then I think there were various other small issues with the skeletons. But none of that, it doesn't say like mass death or mass casualty situation or anything like that. It sort of sounds like your normal, normal things people die of today, really. Kind of like, like a family plot, though. Yeah, it could have been. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. With that amount of rich goods buried with it. Mm-hmm. The other thing they were interested in, too, though, is it wasn't just like the gems and the fancy rich stuff. There was also just like a ceramic pot with some uh, fat residue mm-hmm. in it. 
and they did test the fat and it is some kind of meat probably and it's just you know an everyday object that was also put into the grave so I guess graves weren't only for your fancy precious things which is meat yeah crazy thing is they said all the people were between 16 and 55 years of age mm-hmm. but determining sex on most of the ones that were looted was difficult because of the damage to the bones done by the looters. Like, they were just hacking through that stuff, trying to find, you know, whatever they... gold! Whatever they could, yeah. (laughs) So, that's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, the traces of cancer were found on the um, skull and pelvis of one individual. Mm. I wonder what kind of osteological impressions cancer has on bones. I know, like, well, certain bone cancers, you'll find, like, a degradation in the... Yeah, I was going to say, it almost looks like... In the bone itself. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff you can find by studying bones and the, yeah. the impressions that certain diseases and I guess aspects of your body, even somebody who's like overweight versus somebody who's not, your muscles attach to your bones differently. Mm-hmm. Your bones develop differently. Your bones grow differently, yes. you know, and, and behave differently for each person. So mm-hmm. as long as you can understand what that looks like now, this is why donating your body to science today is actually a good thing because they can say, okay, so we've got an individual who is this and this and this. What do their bones look like? Yeah. And they can take that table of data and go into the historical or prehistorical record mm-hmm. and apply those same methodologies. Yeah. And I think the other thing that is interesting about this group of people is that more than just the items that were buried with them, because a grave is more than just the grave goods, right? It's mm-hmm. the people that inhabit it. And this museum in the Czech Republic that is doing this research, what they're trying to figure out is like migration patterns yeah. throughout the area to figure out where people are coming from and when. And I think they want to do more testing on these bones to get a better idea of who they are and where they came from. Yeah. Which I felt like they sort of left that out of the, was it Life Science? Yeah. 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 I feel like they sort of left that part out of that article a little bit, which is just another one of those like mainstream media kind of things that's a little bit annoying is that they sometimes go for the big and flashy and leave out what might actually be more important from a research perspective. I'm really digging what they did from the the bones of these things and what they can tell. One one other thing that was found was uh, they said one person's leg bones showed that they carried muscle mass asymmetrically, which means they had more muscle on one leg versus the other. And they said that hinting that they favored one leg over the other, perhaps as a result of a stroke. I I think saying perhaps as a result of a stroke without other evidence sounds pretty presumptuous to me because yeah. maybe the maybe the person you know had something where they did something with one leg and they they moved it around a lot and and that you know caused them oh, to have that muscle okay. or or maybe it was an injury yeah well i i mentioned that earlier i guess i maybe i didn't say it clearly but what i read from that was that they the muscle was underdeveloped on one side Mm. and indicating that there was less use on one side and that's how they drew the stroke conclusion but i didn't think about the fact that maybe whatever task or job that they did caused them to use one leg more over the other i don't know what that job would be that would cause that but it's definitely something as far as an injury I feel like they would see evidence of an injury if that were the case that caused one leg to be be used more than the other but Mm -hmm. yeah um, unclear but definitely an interesting idea that it could be from a stroke yeah all right well yeah well that was a cool grave and Bohemia, so we're gonna take a short break and then move on to a bone tool in Australia. That's right. Yeah. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. All right, welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 117. For the video, i got to remember to talk into the camera. Into the camera. For you audio <laughs> folks. It sounds pretty much the same, hopefully. <laughs> so, 
we're moving over to Australia for this one, and there was a, what the article says here, a rare bone tool artifact found. Mm -hmm. uh, and bone tool means a tool made out of bone. Right. So, I mean, it sounds pretty explicit right there. Yeah. Pretty and this, right. And this was more of a point crafted out of kangaroo or wallaby bone. And because I guess they've got an abundance of kangaroo and wallaby, but wallaby bone. I don't know how old those animals are. Yeah. They've been around for many, many thousands of years. Yeah. It was actually uh, later, it was, what was it? So it was a. Uh, Later discarded or lost in the sediment um, for thousands of years, it says, until it was painstakingly excavated in 2008. I don't know mm -hmm. why it's coming around now. Maybe they just did a paper on it. Yeah, I think so. Something yeah. Like that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It said it was radiocarbon dated to between 5,300 and 3,800 years old and was likely used to pierce soft materials like cloaks made of possum fur or perhaps hafted launcher projectile for use in hunting. So basically, it's a point yep. that you could have poke stuff point. with. Yeah. Whether it was, you know, some sort of fabric, some sort of, not fabric, but, you know, leather type mm -hmm. uh, for not leather either because they didn't have cows, but you know what I mean, like a hide. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or you could put it on a shaft. Now, I would assume if this were hafted onto some kind of shaft, that there might be some evidence of hafting that they would have discussed in the article. But this article that we're reading here doesn't mention that. A lot of times you can see those wear patterns from whatever hafting materials used to secure it to the end of a tip. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe they're just saying that this type of point could have been used for that because certainly you have bone, I guess, projectile points, for lack of a better way to say it, all over the world, really. Yeah. You know, anytime bone fractures, you can see, I guess, recent bone, like if you break your leg and you see the, uh, you see the x-rays, you can see the sharp points. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, and you take these long bones and you splinter them, especially when you've got one that's disarticulated from a skeleton and you just like smash it you almost don't have to do anything to it yeah you know you could kind of sand it down on some yeah. some coarse rocks yeah but you could do a lot with uh with bone right there if you've got a poor source material for rocks and things mm -hmm. so i would imagine bone would be better too for hunting because man rock just fragments and you know you hit something with a rock and it's going to hit a bone it's going to hit something in there when i say rock i mean like an arrowhead yeah and it's going to possibly shatter itself or little pieces are going to break off but the bone I mean, there's already bone inside the animal. So, like, what are you getting when that breaks off a little bit? Yeah, it I seems don't know. smoother and like it would just pierce right in. I haven't really thought about that. Yeah. Like, what the benefits or drawbacks to right. bone or or stone or whatever. But yeah, but I think the interesting thing about this particular point is that they've recovered it at all because I think in Australia mm -hmm. they just don't have a great history of finding intact bone artifacts like this. Yeah, they so. say that you know, archaeology is dominated by stone tools yeah. and uh, shell middens uh, found on the surface because uh, archaeology, uh, a lot of Australia in this area anyway, not all of Australia, but a lot of Australia is like a desert, right? Yeah. So stuff stays on the surface really for a long period of time. It's like where we work a lot in, in Nevada. In Nevada. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of soil creation or soil deposition because there's not a lot of water movement. There's yeah. not a lot of vegetation to help drop leaf litter, which eventually turns into new soil. Mm -hmm. So there's just not a lot of that. So stuff that was dropped 10,000 years ago is still sitting on the surface. Yep. And bone, when that happens, this is why I don't think we've ever found any bone in uh, in Nevada, no, personally. It just... Yeah, and ceramics, too. Ceramics kind of come along the same thing. They dry out and they basically turn back into yeah, sand. Yeah, they just decompose. Yeah. And before we could even possibly find them. So, yeah, and it doesn't yeah. take very long, either. Uh, mm -hmm. And unless they're kept in a cave environment, which can be a, a little bit higher moisture level, and that mm -hmm. tiny bit of light, uh, more moisture level is enough to just keep it intact from just disintegrating into dust. Mm -hmm. Because caves will often have uh, higher moisture content year round for you know many many centuries mm -hmm. so so this was found uh buried beneath the surface and that's why it was probably intact mm -hmm. you know it's hard to find stuff like that you know if it's buried then you're more likely to find it because otherwise it's just going to disintegrate and go away yeah exactly yeah so pretty cool and something else to note here that you know five thousand years is uh at the high end of this age estimate is you know, it's old, but that's really not that old in Australian terms. There have been, well, Homo sapiens in Australia for yeah. 60,000 years. Yeah. And probably other hominid species in Australia for much longer mm -hmm. as well. And they say that the first bone tool was actually found in Australia that was uh, 46,000 years old. Yeah. So, again, not crazy surprising because bone is a ever-replenishing resource. Yeah. You can grow your own tools. Yeah, and I think I, I when I was reading that article... 
I think I was reading that not only do they have an example from 46,000 years ago, but also all the way up to present day, basically, the indigenous peoples are using bone to make yeah. various different tools and things. So it's like the tradition of using bone, they have an unbroken history of it. So, yeah. you know, to find a 5,000 year old example is really cool, but it means that there was definitely more in between the 46,000 years ago, the 5,000 years, and present day. It's just that right. preservation issues mean that we don't always have them or see them and don't have a good idea of what they look like, but we can guess that they definitely existed. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah, to find one that fills in a little bit of a gap because you can't, like when you've got present day native tribes doing it, but then you also have like 40, 60, like you don't really know what happened in between, but at least we now have this one example that's a little bit more in the middle to say, okay, mm-hmm. yes, bones were definitely part of the, the tradition. So, yeah. Interesting thing that I'd like to know about tool use or tool creation in general or tool morphology is called the shape is that stone tools have a relatively clear progression across the world from larger spear points. So a heavier, longer, larger tool that would be hafted onto a much longer shaft because you got to throw this thing and mm-hmm. it's got to be balanced and weighted just right. So it's not going to tumble through the air. So you got a much bigger projectile point on the end there. It's got, uh, it's going much farther. It's going, you know, really fast into something than say like, an arrowhead and and it's going into a much larger creature Mm -hmm. so it's got to be able to get through this creature and you know pierce their lungs or heart or something uh, in order to take them down Mm -hmm. but as you go through time and again we mentioned in a previous episode is this related to the you know mass megafauna um, reduction across the planet The, the bigger animals just dying off and smaller animals coming into favor I don't know but tools clearly come down in size Mm -hmm. so in a place like Australia it's it'd be interesting to see or not even Australia but anywhere with bone tools which is pretty much everywhere Mm -hmm. uh, they all kind of seem to be the same well I mean they're a little bit limited on size right like animal bones are only so big so they can only get so big right but taking like a mammoth femur you could make a spear point that's like this big you know, I yeah, mean, you wouldn't want without to, losing but... integrity, though. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the material itself that that limits the size. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, possibly limits function too, because you always see them as really sharp point tips, and uh, and I, I haven't seen too many examples. I'm, not that I'm authority on this by any means, but I haven't seen too many examples that are seem to serve a different function than that. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, it seemed to do something else. So you definitely see other stuff made out of bone. Yeah. Like the famous Neanderthal bone flute, I think. Yeah. You know? Well, I always think of bone awls too. Like oh, yeah. For like yeah. punching through. Yeah. Still things. kind of just a pointy tip though. It is. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, a bone is practically so, like already ready to go in that shape. Yeah. So, yeah. But they're very strong and uh, yeah, they're, they're good tools. Probably don't need sharpening and I guess the only way you would really sharpen them again is to kind of but sand them down probably yeah. on something coarse. Yeah, so. for sure. All right, well, the birds want us to go. So <laughs> you can hear that. Loud. But <laughs> yeah, thanks for this. Let us know what you thought in the comments and please head over to the YouTube channel even if you didn't if you didn't watch it here and subscribe just so we can get up to 100 because uh, we just, we do, we've had this YouTube channel for a long time but we really just started using it recently mm-hmm. with the new functionality of one of our recording devices. Now it has uh, video capable across mm-hmm. the planet. So that's really cool. So we're going to start using that more and more. But again, YouTube's policies are you can't change your URL. <laughs> yeah. you get hundreds of and you like signed up for it in your personal name like, oh, yeah. like 10 years ago. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so, so I changed that. Yeah. Uh, it's all it's all changed now. But now, um, yeah, just go over there and subscribe yeah. and, and you'll see some of this other stuff coming out. So. Mm-hmm. And also, if you're interested in supporting us, arcpodnet.com forward slash members. You can become a member for $7.99 a month or 30% off of that if you buy for the year. And it really helps us keep all this going. Uh, we don't use that to pay for trips to Cancun. This was part of our timeshare. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we use it to pay for all the things that help us get these podcasts going. Mm-hmm. And uh, editing is a service that shouldn't be free and is uh, not cheap when you pay for it. Good, high-quality editing and everything else that we do. So much yep. appreciated to our current members as well. Yeah, so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. That's right, hopefully with some good Chichi Nitsa content. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at archpodnet. 
You can also find us on the Lyceum app, a podcast app just for educational podcasts. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.